I actually think that there is better technology that exists today to be able to get the information of who you're trying to call without having to call a office. And anybody who I want to call, for the most part, I can get their cell phone number, I can get their email, I can get their, uh, you know, their, their direct line. And, and granted, you have to be you know, judicious about when and who you call. Like You're not going to just start randomly calling somebody's cell phone. But you know, calling somebody's direct line at a business, that's way easier than having to go through the gatekeeper at the reception and try to get around that gatekeeper to get them to transfer you to that person. Hello, everybody. Timmy Nafso here, and we are on Embedded, the podcast by Fortis. Today, we have Ron Dichter with us, Chief Revenue Officer of Fortis. Ron has a 25-year career in the payment industry as a founder, CEO, senior executive, as well as advisor and board member to several companies over the years. A true leader in payments, revenue creation, fintech, and software. Also, amazing head of hair. Amazing smile, Ron, my friend. Welcome to the Embedded Podcast. How are you? Wow. I, thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. That guy sounds really impressive. Let me know when he gets here. <laughs> All right. He's arrived. Here he is. <laughs> Ron, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with you over the last several years, of course, and I've, I've certainly enjoyed the experience, and I think you have a really interesting story. Um, but before we get into kind of the professional side of things, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, your background. I know that you, uh, interesting, not many people were born in Alaska or grew up in Alaska. If you want to tell us a little bit about that and that journey, skiing being a big part of your life, would love to hear a, a little bit about Ron and, and the journey that, that is Ron. And then eventually, how did you get into the payment ecosystem? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I'm probably the most un-Alaskan Alaskan you will ever meet. Uh, you know, technically I was actually born in New York and I moved to Alaska when I was 10 months old, but grew up my entire childhood was in Anchorage, Alaska for, uh, 14 years of those in a little town called Girdwood, uh, which for about two and a half years. Growing up Alaska, look, it's like anywhere else. Um, you know, it's it, it just like I live in Florida today. And if you replace the sand with snow, more or less the same place. I mean, Alaska's you know, people think of it as I'm going to school on my dog sleds and living in my igloo and, you know, anything else that comes to mind when you think of an Alaskan. But, you know, Anchorage is a pretty decent sized city and pretty normal in the uh, grand scheme of things, albeit Internet wasn't around when I was growing up. So the joke was everything was two years behind, which was true. Um, I was, you know, fashion forward right up until I went down to visit some family in the lower 48s. And they're like, wow, you're uh, you're quite outdated, my friend. Uh, so outside of that, it was a very normal place to be. Uh, ski racing was something that uh, I started doing, call it middle school time frame. Um, always was into competitive sports. You know, you name the sport, I was into it. But at some point, you got to pick your journey. And skiing was the love. I always enjoyed being in the mountains. I uh, got into competitive ski racing, uh, you know, as I said, in middle school and, you know, raced all throughout uh, high school, had some pretty great people that uh, I got to compete against when I was growing up in Alaska. Uh, Tommy Moe, who, if anyone out there knows uh, competitive ski racing, you know, he's a gold medalist and decorated uh, ski champion. He was the eldest at my school. He was a senior when I was a freshman and he used to whoop my butt on the slopes. So uh, learning from people like him was a ton of fun. And then um, actually spent a year in Maine before heading off to college to learn how to ski on ice, which uh, is a totally different world. If you ever have skied in the East, it is not like skiing in the West, but uh, it's been a big part of my life ever since. So here we are, uh, you know, you've, you've expanded uh, your entire experience as you've grown and watched the entire indus industry shift. We've watched it together over the last several decades. I would say this is probably the most difficult time in consulting and sales and so on and so forth when it comes to um, the payment industry as a whole. Like the entire ecosystem has become more challenging. You know, like you said, when we started, it was, you know, well, I'll save you money and, and drop a terminal. And, you know, maybe the, the thing we were up against most was a contract in some cases. Um, getting a hold of folks was, was, you know, fairly easy. 
in a COVID, post-COVID, e-com, um, you know, now we're starting to see these systems come together with APIs and SaaS and, you know, what used to be the, you know, sale has totally shifted. So the foot on the street model or the, the picking up the phone model and just dialing, has that presented challenges that have shifted the industry as you see it today, including why trade shows, right? There are some people are like, ah, trade shows are a thing of a past. Well, then others are like, nah, that's the where you actually get to shake hands and get in front of people back to the door to door concept, a different way of door to door as we've seen it. So your perspective on is it harder today than it ever has been? Do we have to be more sophisticated than we've ever been? And how has the SaaS play? I know that's three questions, three part questions, so we can answer them as we go. But how has the SaaS play uh, affected our ability to um, to scale? I, I think there's three buckets to get to the end merchant, you know, end user, if you will. Um, the first bucket is going to be, you know, the software uh, companies that have built up their clientele. They engage those customers directly. You know, there's probably only one, maybe two options that a client has. And those are, you know, software companies leading the charge to get those end users. Those, those are going to be very hard for a sales rep to get to because they don't have a way into that integration, right? They're on the outside looking in. The second bucket is going to be a software, but software is... Uh, either partially or fully agnostic, and you can access it if you have the right keys to be able to, you know, tap into it through a connection, and and that has a very similar sales approach um, with with some tech specifics that you need. And then the last is, you know, the hesitant uh, business owner that's not using any software or isn't using anything specific, and there are still opportunities out there, amazingly, um, for those you know, savings calls or contract calls that, that live out there. But to the core of your question, whether you're contacting the software companies, whether you're contacting, you know, a end merchant or anything in between, is it harder today to actually talk to them and actually win that business, right? That's the core question here. Uh, I would say that the answer is no. And let me tell you why. So I actually think that there is better technology that exists today to be able to get the information of who you're trying to call without having to call a office. And anybody who I want to call, for the most part, I can get their cell phone number, I can get their email, I can get their, uh, you know, their, their direct line. And, and granted, you have to be you know, judicious about when and who you call. Like you're not gonna just start randomly calling somebody's cell phone, but you know, calling somebody's direct line at a business, that's way easier than having to go through the gatekeeper at the reception and try to get around that gatekeeper to get them to transfer you to that person. So I can get that direct phone number more you know, readily than I could before in that email. Again, you got to make sure you don't call people's cell phones and start spamming them email. Like that's not what, at least that's not what we're all about. But, the, the, but being able to call someone's direct line for sure. Like, yeah. and not, and not, so, so again, I think being able to get to the person is actually easier. Now, when you actually get them on the phone or email, uh, you know, are they willing to listen? So if you're calling them saying, hey, you know, this is Ron, I can save you a thousand bucks on your merchant account, like that, that's probably a tired story that's not gonna go very far in today's day and age. Sure. But if you understand some of the complexities of the industry, and you can start talking in a vernacular that's different than maybe what your peers are, are, are talking about. And you can start talking intelligently about, you know, software integrations and understanding, you know, how we can be a more elegant solution or, or you know, we understand who you're connected to. Like, I think that if you have a sophisticated salesperson that has the talking points, has the understanding of what's real in the industry today, and is able to call a direct phone number to their extension as opposed to going through the gatekeeper, I actually think you're more effective because most people don't know how to get around that. So let's, I mean, let's think about this, Tim. Most of the people out there don't have the dollars to invest in the software to be able to get what I'm talking about. Like they just won't invest in their business. And I can countless friends of mine who run, you know, successful businesses. But when I say, hey, why don't you use this software? to be able to gain access to it. They're like, eh, I'm not going to spend money on that. You know, kids need a new uh, pair of braces and I don't want to invest money in, in software when I 
can, you know, like they just, they pull money out of the business and you got to be willing to put money back into the business if you're going to have success and you got to be willing to invest in modern technologies. The other thing, and, and this is really a, I don't even want to call it a generational thing. This is a fear I have for the future of our sales nation, we'll call it. Uh, people don't know how to talk anymore. And, you know, people are so used to speaking and talking in short form and then they start emailing like they text and they start talking like they text, people aren't going to respond to that. There are still professional people that want to hear professional people on the other end. And so, again, if you continue to perfect your craft and become good at what you do, I actually think it's easier today than it used to be. You just have to become better at what you do to be good. So that's going to create uh, you know, a divide between those who can and those who can't. And that, frankly, should be how it is, is if you're willing to spend the time and invest in your business and your craft to become the best that you can be, you should have a leg up over your competition. Oh, that's brilliant. I think I haven't thought about it that way exactly um, because you're right, right? We have to take pictures of a, you know, there was no Google to actually see if the business was real or not. Like we used to have to right. go take pictures, put everything into a file, send it off. Wait, uh, you didn't provide a void a check. Go get one. There was, yep. you know, there was no take a picture with your phone. So, you, you know, that's a, that's a really valid point that I didn't think about from that angle. And it's interesting to, to, to see that also, I think if I were to, double down on that. It's like the educational resources that exist at our fingertips with YouTube and things like that give us another leg up if you're willing to do the research, spend the time in in your craft, um, as, as you're mentioning. That's really, really an interesting way to put it. So as we think about the strategies of companies, um, including you know, what Fortis is doing today and others, this idea of specialization has become really important and in, in knowing the industry. And I think that's also what you have alluded to here is like knowing the customer also, it used to be very much in, te in technological uh, uh, formats, just kind of a sh large shotgun approach. Like every, everything works for everybody and you have to fit into the model. Now what we're seeing is a lot more specialization, understanding the nuances, as you said, of the customer, understanding what their needs are, a lot of those things uh, that help us grow. So as we're looking at the strategy uh, from your perspective, are you seeing also this SaaS shift, as I was discussing earlier, that those that are not afraid of that change, that are accepting of that change, they're easier to work with because they have invested in their businesses and their expectation I would imagine, is one in which the people that they're talking to also fully understand the capabilities of their business. I, listen, I think it would be uh, it, it would be foolish to think that the future of payments doesn't involve software, right? And, and it's almost as if payments now have become uh, table stakes you know, in the scheme of what you expect out of your, you know, out of your software that you're going to be using as a business. And so, you know, for, for us to remain relevant, like we have to not just pick our areas of expertise, we have to be able to go deep on those areas of expertise. And if I understand your question correctly, you know, a lot of these SaaS companies, you know, they get called by all sorts of companies, not just Fortis, but you, you name it. There's a, just like calling merchant back in the day, you're calling software and partners, you're getting the same number of people that are trying to earn that business. And, it, and instead of it being about savings, it's about earnings. And instead of being it about contract, it's about terms. And you know, the, 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 the whole sales process is the same thing, just from a different vantage point. And I, I think that you know, one of the areas that you have to be good at today is not just being horizontally relevant. You have to be vertically relevant. And the way you're vertically relevant is that you become an expert of the vertical that you're focused on. And maybe it's not one vertical, maybe it's a handful of verticals, but when you can understand a vertical, and not just the needs of you know, how the software works for that vertical, but more importantly, how the customers of those software companies utilize that software and where the pain points still exist and where the pain points you know, haven't been solved, and you can come in there and augment what they're doing, like you become not just you know, an expert in payments, you now become an expert in their vertical. And now you become a trusted ally for information. And I think that's one of the areas that you know, our teams have been so successful about is that 
we don't just go into a vertical and say, we're, you know, we're putting a flag in it and saying, we're good at this. We actually walk the walk and we become so ingrained and so, you know, versed in what that vertical needs that we have the, you know, the innate ability to solve problems and frankly, the right to win in those verticals because of our ability to understand them. And I think that's where a lot of people really struggle is taking the time to, to understand the vertical needs and vertical complexities, you know, that, that maybe your SaaS company solves 80% of them and you have to bring in the other 20% to solve what's missing. I think that's where a lot of the, the, the failures happen is that people only go surface level and they never really get deep into that. Yeah, the commitment I think is hard for people as well, right? Like it's like, hey, I have to commit to an industry. I have to commit to a vertical and I have to commit that I'm going to understand this really well. And, you know, the saying goes, you know, if everybody's your customer, nobody's your customer. So like you're kind of talking at a the broad stroke high level. Well, in order ultra, to be ultra successful, you're going to have to dig in somewhere and, and commit. And I think that's hard to do. I think it's hard to make that commitment for, for folks of, is this the right place to commit? Well, I'd rather be here too. And then all of a sudden they have a lineup of every industry that they serve because right. they're, they're, they're being served. They're not serving <laughs> this is what starts to happen, right. um, which is interesting. Um, yeah, and, I mean, and, and how and I was going to actually ask you, how do you actually decide on the vertical? Is it a passion play? Is it is it scaling through people like, hey, I, I want to be in healthcare as an example. So I'm going to make bring on champions of healthcare. That's something that we looked at historically. Or is it more of it starts at the root of you yourself as you start to expand? Well, I would say we never lead verticals by passion because that's the wrong, you know, the wrong thought process behind it. You know, the, the area that I focus on is, you know, where can we serve value? Where can we serve a need? And, you know, do we have, uh, you know, do, do we have the right solution for what we know of the vertical? And, and obviously in the beginning, we don't know the vertical as well as we're going to as we start to dive deep. So typically what we do is we have, I won't call it a shotgun approach, but I will call it a, uh, it, you know, somewhat of a, laser focused approach, but it's not one vertical. Maybe there's four or five verticals that we're going to do some testing into to see what vertical we think, you know, maybe, you know, in a whiteboard session, we pick out five verticals that we think we have the right solve based on the information we have. And then we'll do some initial campaigns, either outbound calling, emailing, social media, uh, you know, things like that to, to see what resonates with those customers. And then as we start to make, you know, may, may have some success and start to have some wins and and begin to understand our customers, we start to chase those wins and we start to use our win as a reason to go get another win. And we have some verticals that we have, you know, over 65% concentration in because we understand the vertical so well. And I think that that is what's unique is that you have to have a really patient and pragmatic approach to going into this and that you can't declare that you're an expert in a vertical without getting into the vertical. And so you have to go out and earn that and you have to you know, cut your teeth initially, start to get an understanding, but you have to earn that over time. And I think, again, we're, we're in this for the long haul. And I think that enables us to really be thoughtful about why we go into a vertical, how we stay in that vertical. And, and there have been times where we get into a vertical and we realize it's, it, it's probably not the area we want to be in because, you know, we've earned, you know, maybe a partner or two and we've realized the solve we thought we had may not be the right fit for what they need. And it's going to take a lot of effort you know, whereas we might have another vertical where right out of the gate, we have the perfect solve or close to the perfect solve and, and we can be successful. So we, you have to be nimble, um, yet you at the same time have to be patient, which is a balancing act. And I'm not, I'm not good out of the box at either of those things. So I have to you know, learn to be very patient and also be willing to uh, pull the plug if something's not, not going right out of the gate. Yeah, I think you're really good at that, though, by the way, but that's just my <laughs> perspective from the outsider. <laughs> I love it. So as, as we start to look at the future of, of payments and where things are going, you know, it's kind of been this thing now where we're hearing terms like first it was commerce. Now it's embedded. Uh, we are thinking about platforms instead of what used to just be merchant services, right? Like we're so far away from just one 
product, if you will, which was merchant services. Where do we see with AI being introduced? Talk to Kevin Shamoon a little bit about that. Talk to Mark Bishop about embedded and, and how that's playing a part versus just integrated payments, right? This has all started to evolve over the last several years. Um, where do we see the future of payments from you know Ron's perspective of where things are going and how AI can affect some of those things from, especially from like the sales and enablement perspective? This is, this is one of those questions that in five years, I may look back and be like, gosh, I was an idiot. Uh, or, because, or, man, I nailed it. <laughs> or, or, or a genius. Um, <laughs> I, I, look, I have never professed to be on the bleeding edge of technology. You know, I, I embrace technology. In fact, I, I take great pride. My son had told me, my son, just for context, is a freshman in college. And he told me last week they were talking about um, you know, Apple Pay and how it's changed the payments landscape, which I love that they were teaching that in college. But he said to the professor that my dad uses Apple Pay more than any person I've ever seen in my life. I literally buy everything with Apple Pay, like everything. Awesome. And, and if I have to take out a wallet, I'm very frustrated or a phone even like I just want to do everything on my watch and it just makes my life easy. So, you know, if you think about it from the consumer standpoint, and there's a bunch of questions inside of there from AI and I'm sure crypto is probably something you're thinking about. Like, I don't think the customer cares. I think the customer, me, the guy paying for whatever it is I'm buying, what I want is the most minimally invasive, easy way that I can confirm a payment and designate where that payment is going to come from. And I think we get so hung up on, you know, these 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 novel things that are, you know, from, you know, is crypto going to replace card or is, you know, card going to replace cash and is, you know, surcharge going to do this. Like there's all these things that are out there. But at the end of the day, the customer cares about how do I get in and out quickly, efficiently, and get what I want. And whether that means that AI is going to help us make decisions by, you know, giving us a guide on like going to the grocery store. One of the worst experiences for me in my life. I can't stand when my wife says, hey, can you stop at the grocery store? Because I'm going to have to charge down 10 aisles to get two things that are on probably aisles I didn't go down. But maybe AI can help me do that. And maybe it can help me check out as, on my way out. I know Whole Foods is you know, attempting to do that with, with hand payment, which I can't seem to get it to work. I've tried, uh, but, but I'm sure they'll perfect that over time. Again, I think what the customer cares about is how do I not spend time buying something and how do I spend my time using something that I bought? And so the easiest yep. path for them to get out of there, better. There's always going to be outliers that say, oh, I want a decentralized you know, crypto world. And then there's going to be other people that said, oh, I don't want to make decisions. I want everything thought out for me. But the, the, the rest of us are kind of in this world where like, we're still humans. We're still living on this earth. We still have to consume things. The easiest path to consume those things is what I am after. So yeah. I think the future of payments is all about simplicity, friction reduction, and elegance. And when those things can all, you know, converge, what you connect to the back end, whether it's a Visa card, whether it's my bank account, whether it's my Bitcoin, I don't think it matters. I think what matters is me as the customer, how do I get in and out quickly, whether it's Absolutely. physical or online? Absolutely. Love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And then one of the things that we're, we're really watching is that speed of transfer occur, even amongst banking, uh, which in the, like, like you said, the check is so inconvenient. We use cards, but if transfers through the Venmos of the world. I mean, I don't know how many of these services I have now are like, we only accept Venmo, uh, you know, yeah. landscapers and, and window cleaners and things like that, like, like uh, office uh, uh, services, right? just Venmo. That's the only thing we take. So I've seen a lot more of that because of the simplicity for them. They don't have to send an invoice out and then wait for somebody to send it back and then go to the bank and do the check clear yep. and so on and so forth. So really interesting, like that concept of invisible payments, right? That they're, they're, just not a thought. It just happens somehow. Right. Um, that's, that's a cool world to be in, I would say. And, and to your point earlier that I never really thought of, it is easier to a certain extent uh, with all the, the resources we have, not just from a sales perspective, but also as consumers of what we would have to go through in order to make a deposit at the bank, pay our bills. Everything's on this recurring kind of theme that we're, we're witnessing and experiencing. So one of the things that I wanted to, to, to ask you as well is the automatic thought process of payments. So like you mentioned paying with a watch or, or so on and so forth. There are a lot of businesses out there that really don't fully understand kind of the service experience of being able to put something on automatic payment. 
Um, and it was something as we were talking now here, it kind of came to mind of, you know, the, the, the percentage of folks still using checks as an example versus using an ACH on file. Uh, do we believe that a lot of that is just from a lack of understanding what technology exists and how inexpensive that technology actually is as we continue to educate the, the consumer who also is the business owner, who also could be the software owner, right? Like they're almost the same people, right? But we are, we're also consumers using these devices. And as a mission, I believe that some of the things that I've believed in preaching is like, how are you not using automatic payments? Like you pay so many of your bills that way. Is there something that you've seen kind of on the, the floor of payments, if you will, that there is a lack of understanding when it comes to that? And, and if, if without real data behind us, you know, what percentage would you say we need to start to penetrate over the next several years of getting folks on this invisible automatic experience? Yeah, I, I think the reason that people are apprehensive about doing those kind of payments is control. Um, obviously, I think fees also are, 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 are part of that. You know, they think if I take a cash or a check, it doesn't cost me anything. Whereas if I take an ACH transaction or, you know, a credit card transaction, there's going to be a fee. I think that is definitely something that we have to work through. Uh, but, you know, that, that that's a very, I think, navigatable thing that we've handled over the past about, you know, speed to payment and all the things that, that offset any fees. But I think if you think about it from a consumer standpoint, so you just said it, all these business owners are also consumers, right? And so think about how you act as a consumer, like me, for example, I am very apprehensive about uh, auto draft from my checking account for the fact that I want control. And, you know, even things like Amazon, I buy the same vitamins probably since I was 20, like literally the same vitamins. And every time I buy them from Amazon, it asks me the same question, do I want to have these on auto pay? And I <laughs> always say no, because I might change my mind. And I don't save $2 because I think to myself, maybe next month I'll change my mind. And maybe I'll buy two bottles instead of one. But I think people, they like control. And, and when you start talking about things that go out of your checking account, it's different. Like if people were able to have this auto debit and it would go to a credit card, I think they would think less about it. But because most of them, you just said, you know, people only take Venmo, you know, which if you don't want to have a fee on a Venmo, you got to have it come out of your checking account. You can't have it come off a credit right. card. So I think people get really leery because everybody runs tight, especially if you're a small business owner and they don't want to have somebody debit them for, you know, X dollars. And all of a sudden they can't make payroll or they can't do something else because someone erroneously debited something and they have to go fight with the company to get their money back. So I think we have to give some sort of comfort buffer for people so that they can feel good that what they're setting up uh, you know, isn't going to impact their lives and or their businesses. And I think that's something that, you know, as a consumer, they must have been burned at somewhere along the line. Yeah. And so that's carried over into how they run their business. And so that's their hesitancy on doing it. But but to your point, I mean, the reality is, is that nobody, right? I mean, okay, nobody. I don't actually know where my checks are. And if one got written, I would immediately call the bank because it's like, I don't think I have any of those. So I don't know if that's real. And then I'm sure my wife probably took one out and, and wrote it for the, <laughs> you know, the tutor is most likely the scenario or someone like that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, look, most, most people have to get on board. This is the future. So it goes back to my earlier comment. People want simplicity and nobody yeah. wants to get a bill and nobody wants to write a check and nobody wants to deal with this. They just want to know that there's a process in place so that if something's wrong, they can get a quick resolution and they don't have to send an email and wait three days to hear from someone. Exactly right. Yeah. Shortening the receivable is a helpful process for a lot of human beings as we continue to kind of operate in this new world for sure. For sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome, Ron. Well, I want to thank you uh, for joining. Uh, we are uh, wrapping up here with a simple question that I'd love to ask. Um, so what book slash podcast slash YouTube video, whatever that version of, of learning that you have, would you suggest to the world? Well, all right. So I do like podcasts. And I also like books. So I'll do one of each and I'll do one that's kind of more personal and one that's more professional. Uh, so I, I typically will listen to podcasts during cardio. Uh, so I've usually got a span of anywhere from 15 to 40 minutes in a day where I can dedicate to podcasts. And that's um, obviously daily I'm not cardio? To embed every, every day, part cardio, seven days a week. Well, I don't consider 15 minutes of anaerobic cardio cardio, but yes, there's, there's some part of my body that's moving outside of weights every day. 
and, and, and so I would say the podcast, I really, I'm a big fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger and he has a really super simple podcast called Arnold's Pump Club. And there's usually two to three, you know, life, usually health related, you know, tidbits of information that I can pick up and things that are nothing that I need to become a data scientist on and nothing that I need to overanalyze, just fun little listen to. And it's short. It's usually less than 10 minutes. So that I like to, if I'm doing a warm up cardio, I'll usually put on Arnold's Pump Club and I'll listen to that. Um, and then from a book standpoint, there's a lot of books that I like out there. And, and my wife will tell you my, my book selection is very boring because all I read is either biographies or business books. And she says, where's the fiction in your life? And I'm like, I, I, I guess I don't have it. But uh, one that I really like is an older book. But one I go back to and I've read a few times is a book called Trust Me, I'm Lying by a guy named Ryan Holiday, who is the, uh, you'd appreciate this, he was the CMO for American Apparel, which was an apparel company out of LA. And the whole idea of the book is about big, grand gestures that take, uh, you know, take your company to the next level by projecting grandeur. And I think all small businesses at some point in their life feel like they're not enough, feel like they're not, you know, big enough to be able to either win an account or big enough to earn it. So they, they pretend. And they project this grandeur like they're this much bigger organization. And Ryan talks about the story of how he did that for American Apparel and, and grew them into you know a, a, one of the fastest growing apparel companies in America. And he did it by these huge grand gestures of projecting grandeur and also you know playing into the 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 media and getting the media to you know really help him grow, unbeknownst to them. Uh, so just a just a fun book that has some really just out there ideas that I really like. I've not read that one, but I certainly know Arnold. And, uh, you know, as he says, you know, get to the chopper because we got <laughs> so awesome, Ron. I really appreciate the time today. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great. I really appreciate it and uh, love the podcast. So keep it up. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Let's recap this podcast with three key takeaways. Number one, the phone call sales tactics are not going to be replaced anytime soon. In fact, Ron believes that it is now easier with the available technology to directly reach the right people. The trick is getting people to listen, and that's where the skill of understanding and vernacular can set yourself up and away from the pack. Number two, before leaping into new verticals and markets, remember that patience is key. You can start by testing and tapping into the people in the space where they're at with outbound calling, social media, and that way you can see what resonates. And as you pick up momentum, you use those wins to get the next win. And he made sure to mention that we should not be afraid to pivot if we're not seeing the results as anticipated. Number three, when it comes to creating an invisible payment solution, getting adoption from the general public might be found in giving control through a user-friendly and comfortable experience. Perhaps people don't want to get bills and write checks anymore, but rather they wanna know that the electronic payment systems that are in place will be there to alert them when potential problems arise. Well, that's the episode of Embedded. If you have found value in this episode, please give us a five-star rating and subscribe to stay up to date on payments, software, and emerging technologies.